Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, this is Grant Dewey, and uh, I'm at Build America Mutual, and uh, thank you for, for joining us today. We've got two uh, uh, very experienced uh, municipal uh, uh, people uh, on, on the call today, and I uh, hope we'll have a, a lively discussion and uh, to talk about um, the, the topic is, you know, can munis maintain their momentum? So, you know, as, uh, as most people know, there's been uh, a, a tremendous performance in the municipal market. It started in the middle of last year. Uh, a lot of it was due to technical uh, factors uh, where uh, there was um, uh, very little supply. Uh, money came pouring back into the mutual funds. Uh, we also have had, uh, you know, a strong um, uh, fundamental credit improvement with some of the stimulus. And so we have two experts here today that will help us kind of understand what drove this performance and, uh, and, and can it last. Um, so uh, we'll start with Kathleen McNamara. So Kathleen is a strategist uh, for CIO Global Wealth Management uh, at, at UBS uh, and a member of the fixed income team uh, focusing on the muni market. Uh, she joined the CIO in 2006 uh, as supervisor supervisory analyst and is a member of the research review committee. Uh, prior to that, Kathleen headed the portfolio analytics group with, within investment solutions and was the municipal strategist for private clients in the municipal securities group. I happen to know Kathleen from uh, my previous life at, at us, McBarney and, and Citigroup. So welcome Kathleen. Uh, and then uh, John Dillon is the managing director of Morgan Stanley. Uh, he's the lead portfolio manager for the fixed income managed solutions team. Uh, John joined Morgan Stanley in 1987, has more than 30 years of investment experience. Uh, prior to this, uh, he was spent uh, 10 years as Morgan Stanley's chief municipal bond strategist uh, and had various positions encompassing municipal strategy, research, trading, sales, underwriting, and corporate credit analysis. So uh, a, a very broad background. And so uh, we welcome um, we welcome them both. Um, and why don't we get started if we can go to the uh, next slide. Um, this, uh, again, just gives a little bit of an idea uh, how municipals have performed versus the other fixed income classes. Um, and uh, uh, year to date, you, um, you can see that uh, municipals, which is essentially a, uh, a credit market, um, has performed uh, well, uh, as have corporates, but, um, uh, but munis have enjoyed you know, about 1% uh, growth, a little bit more than 1% growth year to date. And, uh, and, and higher growth than that in, in the higher yielding sector. So, um, John, why don't, uh, why don't I start with you? Um, and we'll start with municipal returns, but can you uh, describe some of the drivers of municipal outperformance you know, versus these other asset classes, um, uh, other fixed income asset classes? And, and almost more importantly, is the performance justified? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and, and thank you. Uh, for having me. And, um, you know, what, what I would say is, you know, it's a question, obviously munis have done incredibly well this year relative to other asset classes. Uh, I, I think the, the uh, Barclays Ag is up over 1% uh, year to date. Uh, and the question of, of relative value and, and outperformance uh, of that relative value, can it continue? Uh, it's, this is a topic that has been pondered uh, by market participants for a few years now, uh, specifically since we had the Trump tax cuts and the issuers lost the ability to advance or fund using tax exempts. So what is often lost in the headlines is just how much the uh, federally taxable munis that are now used for refunding purposes of outstanding bonds are actually cutting into the available supply of tax-free munis uh, that most US-based investors typically uh, will purchase. So every week, we, you know, we see just about every week, we see the new issue calendar being 20 to 35% comprised of federally taxable munis. And this isn't exactly a new development. We've been 
for the full year of 2020, uh, taxable immunities were about 30% of the total. Uh, so, you know, aside from the last few years, though, we haven't seen this much in taxable issuance as, as a percentage of the total since we had the Build America Bonds program in the Obama administration post-financial uh, crisis. So there, there's the other thing that's part of this, too, and, is, uh, and we have the next slide uh, that shows this, is there's a very seasonal aspect uh, with supply demand imbalances. So while the record low for 30 year relative value versus treasuries occurred just last week, uh, a, a new record low for 10 year benchmark actually was set back in, in February. Uh, so that said, we, we could actually see another run at the record low of 55% on the 10 year maturity uh, benchmark in the coming months. So if you look at that accompanying uh, blue bar chart there, uh, which is the redemptions according to ICE data uh, streetwide, you can see that we're facing the three biggest redemption months of the year. Uh, and the fourth largest happened to be back in February when that new record low uh, was set. So once we get beyond the uh, acute reinvestment window of June, July, August, we do expect ratios to ease back a little bit, but it's likely that on an historic basis, they are gonna remain rather rich. So yes, I do think they will generally be maintained at levels that most people, uh, most market participants would consider uh, both impressive and expensive. Uh, so, you know, we probably make new uh, run at new lows in the next couple of months, uh, but generally, uh, I think, you know, it's a supply constrained market. It's a very robust demand market for a number of factors that, that we'll get into. Uh, and I think that does endure through year end. So, so I think munis are going to continue to outperform to varying degrees. Interesting. I mean, uh, Kathleen, so John touched on, you know, 55% ratios in 10 years and, and, uh, that is the uh, a, a muni ratio is, is basically the 10-year AAA risk-free muni yield uh, divided by the, uh, by the treasury yield. And so those will uh, tend to fluctuate um, based, on, uh, based on muni supply. And so at 55%, you know, if you're a taxpayer in the, you know, in the 35 to 40%, uh, it's barely a break even. But Kathleen, do you agree that, uh, that uh, ratios down in that area are sustainable given kind of the tax outlook? Um, I think that in the near term, as John was saying, um, the technicals are very strong with, um, you know, reinvestment capital outstripping, um, you know, the, the outstripping the supply. There's just not enough bonds to meet the demand. So I think in the near term, those ratios can stay rich. But I do think that um, longer term, when we get some more clarity, on the tax policy, as well as rates, I think we could see muni yield ratios cheapen from current levels, just to account for the additional liquidity and credit risk associated with the muni market versus the US Treasury bond market. So UBS, I mean, as you well know, retail uh, investors continue to commit uh, tons of capital to the market. I mean, we've seen 15 straight weeks of inflows totaling almost uh, just about 34 billion. Um, in flows into uh, mutual funds. Um, do you, are you hearing any persistent concerns? Uh, I mean, obviously that's very bullish, but are you hearing any consistent, uh, persistent uh, concerns kind of based on, you know, we've come a long way in terms of uh, spread compression and rates are, uh, you know, near their lows. You've got to go out 10 years really to, to get um, a yield uh, above 1% if you're staying in the AA to AAA. So, uh, what are your investors saying and um, thinking? Yeah, absolutely, Grant. That's a question that we're getting uh, almost on a daily basis. Like, uh, you know, why should I bother with munis if they're only yielding 1%? That's a very popular question. And how we respond to um, investors is that even though, you know, rates are very low, you know, we do remind investors that municipal bonds continue to play an important role within a diversified portfolio for at least three principal reasons. You know, that first is the fact that munis do provide a steady stream of tax-free income 
that's not available in other investments? And should marginal tax rates go up, which is what we eventually expect, not go down, that value of that tax-free income stream goes up and is, is more valuable. You know, the second reason is that the probability of payment defaults in the asset class remains low. And third, more importantly, one of the conversations we're having today is that munis have low correlation with the performance of equity securities. Therefore, they often provide a source of wealth preservation as well as a level of comfort during equity market drawdowns. That low default ratio sure uh, kind of solidified uh, itself as we went through the pandemic. I think there were quite a few, um, you know, uh, quite a few less uh, credit deteriorating uh, situations, you know, statewide. Uh, John, it seems like statewide, a lot of the um, tax revenues have been, you know, uh, higher than expected. And so I think most municipal issuers came through the pandemic pretty well. Would you agree with that? Yeah, absolutely. It was very impressive. But one thing I just wanted to add to, you know, investors approaching this market, uh, a lot of people are concerned, quite obviously, about rising interest rates. And a lot of times the, the perspective is, is lacking on that. And I found that um, depending on, on the person's historic perspective, you know, if, if you say rates are rising or going to rise, a lot of people uh, who have seen the 70s, have seen the 80s, you know, they're thinking high single digits. Whereas if you're only in the market the last five years, you're thinking low single digits. Uh, so, but just to put some context on that, you know, when right now, I could tell you uh, Morgan Stanley's year end 10 year US Treasury forecast uh, is 180. And by uh, end of second quarter next year, uh, it's 2%. And just to put that versus the landscape, if you look on uh, the Bloomberg uh, consensus survey, uh, the street consensus for year end is, is 188 uh, as of today or as of posting on it. And the street consensus for uh, end of second quarter next year is 2.02%. So, you know, while there's some dispersion, obviously, around the street, um, it's not a situation where where the street in general is looking for runaway rates. And I think that perspective matters when you're building a muni portfolio that's going to have a multi-year uh, horizon on it. Uh, as, as far as, you know, the... Uh, was, you know, was the uh, credit market, was the aid enough? Uh, I think, I think yes. And uh, I, I think credit came through with flying colors, uh, but there, there are still um, sectors that, that we, we have to watch out for. And I don't want to get off topic, Grant. Yeah. Is that what you wanted me to chat about right now? Or well, I mean, you brought up an interesting point. I mean, if we look at, uh, we talked about the performance year data as being positive in municipals. Uh, if you look at the 10-year treasury uh, since, um, since uh, early January, it's um, gone from a, a 90 basis points up to about a one, uh, I think we're around 145 now. So a 55 basis point rise in treasury rates and you've got positive uh, total returns across um, all, the, uh, all the municipal ratings. So uh, there is a sensitivity to interest rates, obviously, but um, there's a lot more that goes into uh, into returns uh, than that. Um, and uh, so uh, let's turn to uh, DC and some of the proposed uh, policy changes that could, you know, impact some of the market dynamics, supply demand. Um, Kathleen, I mean, some of the major ideas being discussed include, you know, restoring tax exempt uh, advance refundings as well as reviving the Build America Bonds-like uh, program that, uh, that has a federal subsidy. Um, and obviously that would, that incentivizes infrastructure investment. But uh, do you think uh, either of these are likely to pass? Um, and if so, what impact will they have on the market? I mean, Grant, at this stage, we're anxiously awaiting clarity on the infrastructure proposal, you know, given its meaningful implications on muni supply. I mean, it's not surprising how to pay for the bill remains a sticking point for lawmakers and the White House. So that's kind of what we're waiting for. I mean, the short answer to your question is that I think it's possible that some municipal bond friendly proposals eventually pass. But of course, the, the devil is in the details and the situation is fluid. 
But what I would say is um, there is a group of 21 bipartisan senators that crafted an infrastructure bill that's sitting um, with uh, the president right now for consideration. And at this stage, we do have some evidence that some direct pay bonds are included in that proposal, but no mention of the tax exempt advance refundings at this point. But of course that could change in future negotiations. Um, so we'll, we'll just have to stay tuned for that. Um, in terms of the income, the uh, impact of the market, I mean, if both of those uh, measures end up passing, I mean, they would both be very positive for issuance on both the tax exempt side and taxable side. And then um, more importantly, um, if we do have more taxable munis, uh, kind of like we did back during the Build America Bond era over a decade ago, that could help the investor base of the municipal market. And that would, you know, overall, we'd see some better liquidity in the market. So, so we are hoping that those programs do come to fruition, but we're going to have to just stay tuned to see what lawmakers end up doing. That's probably good, uh, probably good advice. Uh, John, do you have anything to add uh, to that in terms of uh, likelihood of, of these policies being passed and what impact they might have? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, this, this is the first shots we're seeing come across the bow. So certainly they, they could they could move around quite a bit. Um, but usually, typically, uh, it's less impactful than a lot of people think it's going to be. Uh, so, you know, as uh, as Kathleen was saying, you know, you could have you could have it could be very positive if you get uh, both the return of the um, advance refunding uh, and and in, in implementation of a build America bond style uh, program. Uh, but, you know, there's there's different things kicking around. And, and, you know, a perfect example, you know, was the salt cap. You know, when salt cap came through, uh, everyone said, oh, everyone's going to be uh, buying munis. And, you know, that that huge influx uh, really didn't manifest itself too quickly. Uh, yes, there's, there's a lot of uh, a lot of interest in munis and there has been and there continues to be. Uh, but, you know, something like that, even if we were to um, lose that cap or, or, or restore uh, the state and local tax uh, deduction without limitation, I, I don't think it would be as much of a headwind uh, as as some people might might think. Uh, right. I think I think the words out on higher taxes, higher marginal tax uh, taxes for upper bracket investors, uh, and I think it's a question of of when, not if, and and by how much, and and that's got to be played out, you know, in, in the due course. Yeah, I mean the salt deduction obviously would, uh, you know, would probably have an outsized impact on the bigger uh, blue states, the higher tax states, um, which is which is uh, um, who was benefiting from the no cap. I mean, but you don't hear much about that in the bills. I know there might have good arguments on both sides, but uh, it doesn't appear that we're going to see that um, uh, in the budget. Um, so the uh, and. Um, so moving on, uh, which you touched on, John, earlier, but uh, municipal credit quality, uh, you know, it's certainly cities, counties, transit agencies, airports, um, you know, a, a lot of these sectors all receive pretty significant federal aid uh, through the ARPA, the, um, the, the rescue plan. And so, um, and it's helped to kind of offset a lot of the costs and, and expenses of the pandemic. What, um, you know, was it enough, which you started to answer, uh, and, and are there any sectors where you still have lingering uh, concerns? Uh, sure, I, you know, it was certainly, it was certainly enough as far as, uh, you know, federal transfers uh, out to all of these different sectors. Uh, and it was impressive the way they, they came through last year and this is anything but a normal market. The distortions we saw last year uh, were just incredible and you know, record setting in, in every context. Uh, and then you had this, this uh, snapback, if you will, where there's a, a very real grab for yield uh, and everything seems like it's, it's wonderful right now. And yes, it is greased by federal monies, but it doesn't take away, in my opinion, 
the basic need for credit research and credit surveillance and monitoring and portfolios. And that's kind of what we, uh, many of us uh, have built our careers on. Uh, so the sectors that I'm concerned about going forward are generally the sectors that have been problematic in, in, in the past. Um, right now, high yield is very much in vogue and I understand it and I think it, it can continue that way. But when you look out a, a few years and most of these portfolios have horizons that are uh, beyond just a few years, you need to be cognizant of what your revenue stream is. Um, you know, the, the ones I worry about right now are, you know, the ones that have been hit in, in the pandemic and are much slower to come back. And, and that would be tourism, uh, hotel tax, and, you know, those kind of narrower revenue streams, um, you know, states and locals, they, like you said, Grant, they, they got a lot of uh, federal monies municipalities got a lot of federal monies, you know, the old tried and true water, sewer, electric, that kind of thing. Those I don't see any issues with. Um, the higher ed, that's, a, that's an interesting one because you do see them coming back and it is anticipated that September is going to be a, a quasi normal kind of uh, September, but you do have, to, you know, you have to pick and choose your credits carefully uh, you do have enrollment declines uh, and, and some lingering effects from the pandemic. Uh, the other one would be um, CCRCs and, and nursing homes, assisted living. Uh, those didn't fare all that well and also got a black eye in the media. So those are, those are things I would watch out for. And then beyond that, you have the newer ones, the newer concerns, which would be um, climate based. So you have flooding and, you know, wildfires and that kind of thing. Uh, and that is, is very idiosyncratic. And that needs a, a different kind of monitoring. Uh, so that that's what I would basically be um, concerned about. And, uh, and Kathleen, the, <clears throat> the aid is, you know, short term, by design, uh, in nature. So what happens, you know, 2023, a lot of the, uh, the, the money is spent to kind of make up for, um, uh, for lost revenue. Uh, and I think it's the, the Fed is expected to be raising rates on borrowing costs. Um, uh, hopefully these municipalities will have, uh, will have stored uh, something away. And I guess, is there a restriction on what they can use uh, the ARPA um, uh, aid for? Does it have to be a project or could they use it to pay down debt? Um, they can use it to pay down debt, but I think um, there's still, I'm still looking for some clarity on some of those definitions. Right. Um, but what I would say is that, you know, beyond like, you know, 2023 and beyond is, is what you were mentioning is I think we kind of would go back to the risks that were in place before the pandemic and, the, and first and foremost is pension risk, right? Um, unfunded pensions, as well as other post-employment benefit funding issues. You know, those are the ones that will make sense to watch once again. I mean, the rally in the equity markets um, over the past year or so has helped some of those pension funding levels, but mm -hmm. when equities goes the other way, um, you know, pension risk will come to center stage once again. And then the two, two other um, elements that I think we need to keep tabs on. One, um, John already mentioned was climate risk. You know, I think, you know, climate risk is, is another area to take note of. I mean, we're already seeing, you know, mitigation efforts by municipal bond issuers to account for some of the rising sea levels and droughts. Um, and the other um, element to keep tabs on is cyber, you know, cyber attacks. Um, you know, we, we keep hearing about, you know, more cyber attacks, you know, receiving more attention um, in the news. Um, they do attack, you know, a var wide variety of entities, including hospitals. So, you know, we have to realize that U.S. municipalities are not immune to these risks and, you know, issuers are going to have to direct some re more resources than they already are to fighting those attacks. So those are just a couple of things that came to mind uh, when you asked what we'd be looking at like a 2023 and beyond. Okay, and uh, we have an interesting uh, question coming in and 
And I don't know if this falls under your uh, purview or our expertise, but you know, obviously ETFs have been a uh, very popular um, uh, retail item, but uh, can you comment at all on closed end funds and how they work and whether you think generally uh, there's value in closed end funds? Uh, sure. Um, yeah, we do cover closed end funds um, at my firm. And, you know, at, at present, uh, we still do see some value in the closed end funds. I mean, the reason that those um, funds pay more than the open end funds is more often than not, they use leverage. Um, so in a market like this, where um, you can borrow at short term rates and invest longer, um, the closed end funds tend to, you know, that leverage tends to benefit the performance of the closed end funds. So that is what we're seeing. Uh, what we do caution uh, investors on is the uh, illiquidity. Um, you know, it is a pretty small market and it, it does move around pretty quickly based on, um, you know, investor behavior. Um, but right now, you know, for a portion of a portfolio to add some extra yield, that is something that we're recommending. We probably have a little more volatility given that leverage, you know, if, if we saw a rise in rates, but a static rate environment, they, they seem to outperform. John, do you have, um, do you have anything to add on, uh, on that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's a, it's certainly a, a growing area. Uh, I don't, I, I don't run any closed end funds or ETFs, but uh, obviously um, the ETFs has been growing. The, the one thing I would mention, is, and and Kathleen kind of kind of brought it up, and she, you know, the leverage lever, leverage works both ways, and every few years uh, we are reminded uh, of that. But the other thing is, uh, it is is more of a blunt instrument. So if you're trying to gain quick exposure to an asset class, uh, I, I think that's a, a great idea. You know, both, both ETFs, closed end funds. Uh, but what we see from a lot of investors and certainly ones who have been in the do-it-yourself crowd uh, for so many years, it's gotten harder to, to uh, implement the, those portfolios. And that's why you've seen a lot of growth in separately managed accounts uh, where, where you have that clarity of, of QSIP and individual positions and all. And the other thing I would say, you know, going forward, uh, not necessarily 2023 and beyond, but uh, coupon income. Um, we're, we're big fans of, of four and five percent coupons, and I would mention that what we've been seeing in the last couple of years is uh, lower coupons than that, and and that has an impact over time on, on your portfolio, uh, both on the duration and the volatility. And we saw that play out last year. Uh, so structure matters. Obviously, call feature matters. Uh, and these are all things that that need to be monitored kind of in tandem uh, along with credit. Um, <clears throat> we're uh, running a little bit short of time, but we have one other question, uh, John, maybe for you, but uh, you had brought up earlier some of the CCRC uh, issues. Obviously, you need to do your homework on on uh, CCRCs and, and they can all have uh, differing um, uh, economics. Um, but do you think longer term there will be a you know, these are paid by debt services paid by user fees. Do you think this is an area that could, that the pandemic will have like a longer term impact on uh, given some of the high profile issues that we saw? Yeah, I, I do think, you know, longer term meaning probably a couple of years mm -hmm. because uh, obviously the aging of America, the demographic supports the notion that these kind of facilities uh, should do well, but as you as you said, Grant, they, these are very idiosyncratic, and you really need to do your homework, um, and that's why you see a lot of them in, in high yield funds uh, because they have the boots on the ground, the people to do the work. Uh, so you know, I, I do think there's value there. I do think the legwork has to be done, and and honestly, there will be probably a, a pandemic uh, overhang from these because it was a it was a very bad human experience uh, for a, a lot of people. And whether it be, you know, something really tragic or simply that you couldn't get to see your loved ones, uh, that, that has a lasting impact that I think will take a little time uh, to wear off. I'm not sure we properly identified what's wrong around CCRC, um, but it's a continuing care retirement uh, center and, and a lot of these can be uh, funded 
uh, with tax exempt uh, debt. They tend to be small. A lot of them are non-rated, and and uh, um, if you're doing your work, um, certainly a lot of the managed uh, uh, you know mutual funds and high yield funds traffic quite a bit in them, but um, they've got a full time staff. So. Um, if there aren't uh, any other questions, I thank you very much, Kathleen and John, and taking us through, uh, you know, why Munis have had such an impressive run. And, uh, and it looks like there are still some legs, uh, uh, legs uh, in the market. So we'll see what comes out of Washington. And, uh, and thank you, everybody. Um, uh, have a good night. And thanks again to our panelists. Thanks, thanks for everyone. having us. Thanks, Grant. Thanks for having me. Thanks, everyone.